Hello. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking today about like Rust and JavaScript interop and like why would you do it, how would you do that, and so on. So I won't be talking like about why we would use Rust because like obviously you came and if you came to the conference that you already like Rust and it was sold many times before. So why JavaScript? Why would you ever choose it like as a target if you have Rust that can actually compile to native and run native and so on? Well, you like it or not, but like JavaScript nowadays is like the real cross-platform target. Like you have it on desktop, like whether it's Mac OS, Linux, Windows, whatever you have, you most likely have a browser that can just run JavaScript no matter on which platform you are. Uh, and this is pretty cool. And like also you have lots of other devices, like it's normal to run it on tablets, just the same JavaScript will just run out of the box. It's really cross platform like no surprise that it's on like available on phones. Like everything basically has browser now, like even TVs or like ebook readers, you might want to just visit some pages and run JavaScript using your reader or even I don't know, like Nintendo. Why don't just you visit Facebook and read something on your Nintendo, right? Or like probably the best idea ever, like while you drive, just visit some website in your car and respond to comments and try to reload pages. What could go wrong? Or you just decided to leave your computer and decided to get some food and went to your fridge, but like here you suddenly saw a browser and you can just continue charging from your fridge. Why? Or like, like it's really available on all sorts of devices nowadays. Like you can even watch your websites on your watch. Not that it's extremely convenient, but like, well, it runs, right? So you just run one code, write one code, and run it literally everywhere. You can just do whatever you want. OK, so uh, how do we do that? Like, Rust is quite low level target, and it mostly compiles to native code. Uh, how do we even get to the stage where it generates JavaScript that can run uh, across all these platforms like without uh, significant changes? Uh, Right? So the answer is mscripten. So mscripten is a project that allows you to, that allowed basically to compile native C, C++ code uh, to JavaScript, or nowadays also WebAssembly target. So the way it does it, like basically takes input C, C++, converts to control flow graph with uh, pretty low level operations, uh, and sends that to LLVM, LLVM generates uh, low-level bit code that is still platform independent, and then it generates like native objects and native executable. Oh, sorry, this is like how CLang works. And scripting is basically uh, just a fork of CLang that changed uh, only two bits. So it removes the need for uh, native objects. So in uh, mscript, like obviously native object doesn't matter because you are not generate like platform specific code anymore. And if you generate static library, it just uh, takes the actual LLVM bit code and uh, archives it together to uh, .a file and so on. And finally, when you are building your executable or dynamically loaded library, instead of building .so, .dll, .eclair, or whatever, it just generates JavaScript for you out of this LLVM bit code, basically translated it one to one, and then probably optimizing. And these both projects are based on LLVM, and luckily, Rust is also based on LLVM. Surprise. Uh, so what Rust does, like, just like C language, just instead of C, C++, it takes Rust, generates CFG SSA using LLVM APIs, uh, generates bit code, native object, native executables that you can run, and so on. So when we put them together, like, we can see that this LLVM uh, block is shared. And what Rust can do, instead of like trying to teach mscripten uh, to understand Rust itself, it can just literally inject and skip all the stages that mscripten does, and just pass the generated LLVM bit code directly to mscripten, and mscripten already knows how to deal with it and convert this low level bit code to the actual JavaScript. So like we uh, just lose all this uh, extra steps with generating native objects and native executable, and, just, uh, and Rust does half of the job coming to the stage where it generates this low level bit code from Rust, like, that is like platform independent and like it just removes uh, vector instructions or 
like other low level stuff that you support only on specific platforms, sends this to MScript, and MScript knows how to generate JavaScript out of it. So how do you get, to be, uh, how do you get started with uh, Rust in JavaScript? Let's write like sim simple hello world. Uh, just a warning, like there will be lots of unsafe stuff. Uh, but initially, let's start, uh, let's try with something simple. Nowadays, it's quite easy because uh, MScript and like ASM.js is native target in Rust itself in Rust core, so you can just write like literally fn main, pretty land hello world, and you compile it using Rust C dash dash target ASM.js and now MScript and. Or if you want to generate a uh, web assembly, just wasp 32 and now in script and firmware Rust. And you can just run like node hello.js, it will print it. Or you can just include this JavaScript in your browser and it will also like print something to console. So this just works out of the box. Sorry. Um, so this is nice and cool, like, but uh, what if we want to export something like build a library? that actually like ex exports some Rust functions to JavaScript so that you could use them instead of just running an entire application on, in Rust and have access to entire DOM to uh, networking API and everything else that is exposed only on JavaScript side, but at the same time use Rust for anything that is fast. So as a simple example, you, we can just like nowadays use uh, same syntax as we use like for exporting C fun uh, functions to CFFI. So we just do pub extend uh, on our function and add no mangle. And uh, Rust will automatically export this uh, function to MScript and tell it that it needs to be exposed to JavaScript as well, not only like on C level. The only problem with this is that it doesn't work. <laughs> like small one. Uh, because static libraries, uh, as I said, like in, in MScript, and they have the same meaning as everywhere else, except instead of native objects, you uh, have an LLVM bit code. So you can't really build a static library that is also JavaScript at the same time. Instead, if you want to build a JavaScript library, you need to build an executable. So you just eat, add empty main. And you compile it as like executable, but it will be a library. As I said, unsafe. Like, the only problem is this <laughs> small one, that it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, so when you just generate like target ASP.js an on script and, and try to require this module, uh, you can see that like node just immediately crashes. Uh, well, it turns out it's not, it doesn't really crash. The problem is that, like, as I said, you generated executable. And MScript and real, it thinks that it should just execute main. And like when main exits, well, that's it, we are done. Even if you just require this uh, JavaScript. Uh, so we need to explicitly tell it not to exit when main finishes, because we, are still, we still want to use other functions that are in this module. Uh, to do this, we need to use uh, unsafe feature flag. So we add a uh, feature link args, and then we can pass some linking arguments directly to MScript. And we just add like empty extern, because that's the only way to pass any link args. And we say like no exit runtime equals one. Then MScript just generates main, which when finishes doesn't exit your Node.js program. <laughs> hacks on top of hacks. Uh, but there is like slightly simpler way that is uh, also available in stable. Uh, so that you don't need to, un to use unsafe feature here. Uh, MScript provides a special function, like MScript and exit with lever and time that you can use instead. It will have pretty much the same effect, just in the end of your main, you say, like, MScript and exit with lever and time, and it will preserve memory, preserve all the functions, but, like, it won't try to actually uh, exit Node.js. And then when, when we try to run, like, with debug warnings, it will say, like, exit implicitly called by end of main, but uh, no exit runtime. time. So not exiting. And now we can actually use functions by using the C main gold name. We just had underscore in front of it. Nice, we can add integers in the Rust and get them back. Uh, what it does internally, in fact, like uh, earlier you had to do that by hand, but now Rust adds a special exportive functions property uh, that it sends to mscript and linker. 
that basically lists all the functions that should be exported to JavaScript side. So by default, it's uh, this Rust app personality, as, uh, like it's for unwind the stack. Uh, main should be always exposed because some scripting needs to find the entry point that it should execute, and like any functions that you uh, marked with pub extend no mangle. So in this case, just add integers. Right now, this is all done uh, like automatically. Uh, so what exactly it generates on the other side? So first of all, it generates like uh, wrappers that actually checks that your runtime wasn't exited, that memory is still available, that it can do anything useful. And then comes the actual add integers. How much do you code to, do you need to add to integers, right? <laughs> this doesn't look extremely efficient. I'm pretty sure the JavaScript implementation of it would be much faster. Uh, but uh, the problem is that like we are just using debug mode here, and uh, among other like uh, since the trust just doesn't optimize, it inserts, as you can probably see. Maybe, like in the end, it just inserts overflow check that uh, when you add two integers, like it does, the number doesn't become too big, and Rust uh, like always inserts them in debug mode, but strips in release mode. So if you try to recompile release mode, uh, the code becomes slightly simpler. So it still doesn't look very straightforward. The reason for that is that, uh, is that AwesomeJS is not exactly uh, normal JavaScript, like you can't just uh, right, like return x plus y here. So AwesomeJS is, in fact, special syntax for very low-level operations that is backward compatible with JavaScript, but it, it compiles like to native code immediately ahead of time, like without any JIT. So in this case, these annotations uh, are like normal JavaScript operations that also tell ahead of time compiler uh, which types do you have on each uh, variable return value, and so on. So in particular, like uh, the first argument uh, or like binary or with zero, it automatically converts number just to set it to bit integer. So ahead of type compiler can no type uh, of uh, this parameter afterwards. Same it does for the second one. So this looks extremely hacky, but basically what it does, it just tells that these two parameters are of type uh, I32. And then when it returns value, it also just adds two numbers and converts them explicitly to I32. So ahead of time compiler, we'll just, we'll just compile this to native code as it would be on any other platform. Uh, another flavor of this that uh, became more or less stable recently, it still doesn't work in Node.js, to be honest, sec faults, uh, is WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is also standardization of the same uh, format, but instead of using JavaScript hacks, it just compiles everything to actual binary uh, bytecode so that you can debug as like in Lisp way, because everyone likes Lisp. Uh, but yeah, like it allows you to uh, have at least nice names for every operation that happens and to see like how exactly they are passed around. So in this case, like you have this get local to just get local variables. Uh, uh, I set it to add is just instruction for it to integers and so on. So in general, AwesomeJS and WebAssembly go to through the same compilation pipeline. The only difference is that the second one is uh, bytecode. So it's much smaller, much faster to transfer over the network, uh, much faster to parse, and so on. But generally, the result is the same native code. So how exactly does it relate? Like AwesomeJS has, like for example, x when you do x plus y x or, uh, or zero, this is the same as in Wasm you say ict 2 dot add, like, and so on. Like when you do f or zero, it's just normal call in WebAssembly. So sometimes WebAssembly output slightly more verbose, sometimes it's uh, the opposite. So the last one is interesting. Uh, the way AwesomeJS accesses memory is uh, by having one single memory blob that is given to it in the beginning, and the same in WebAssembly. And it can only use, uh, only, uh, use memory from the same uh, typed array. So in the very beginning, mscripting generates just one uh, buffer allocation, and then creates tons of use of different types of this same buffer. This way, when you try to dereference any pointer, it actually tries to access one of these arrays, and as long as you don't violate pointer uh, aliasing, you can actually, uh, for example, put U8 uh, at some 
point hands and like create Q32 out of it and so on. Like, so the idea is basically it's just like uh, buffer reuse, buffer reuse over the same memory block. And in fact, in mscripten, you can uh, do things like dash dash memory profiler when you pass it to link arcs, when, when it actually tells you like how much memory is used for uh, st statically allocated stuff, how much memory is used for malloc and free, and so on. OK, this is nice-ish. Uh, but how do we do anything useful from Rust? How do we actually um, call out to stuff that is exposed only to JavaScript? For that, in C++ side, mscript has this mass macro, where you can just put any uh, JavaScript code inside of it, and it will actually call uh, this on JavaScript side and get the result back and cast it to needed type. So in order to have the same in, in Rust, we would have to look how exactly it's implemented in mscript itself. So when we try to go to uh, mscript and includes, like the default headers, we can see that it's just as one to a uh, function call where we just pass a stringified version of this JavaScript. OK, let's find this function. Uh, when we find this function, like the definition is not extremely helpful because like it just doesn't exist. And like what is happening here? <laughs> I'm not kidding. Inside mscript and like for, the, for these calls to make them efficient, like to, not to actually every time pass string from raw memory converted to JavaScript string, execute it through eval or something. So mscript has Python script that actually goes through your LLVM bit code finds literally mscript and asm const int with a string and generates a function on JavaScript side. <laughs> Python scripts, yeah, I know. So in the end, this main function will have mscript and asm const v instead. So mscript specialized the uh, assembly call with return type v stands for void in this case. And then in the JavaScript outside of asm.js, it just has literally an array of functions where it accepts this code, like zero in this case, and just calls this function like by uh, the references array. This tons of hacks, but it works quite efficiently compared to like any normal eval or something else. OK, so let's try to implement something similar in Rust just to have the same access. Well, first attempt, like, we would want to just use normal and str. Obviously, it doesn't work because mscripten expects C style strings. Who doesn't like strings that end with zero byte? <laughs> and yeah, it doesn't handle Unicode at all. Don't try. Uh, so instead, we have to use actual pointer to set of bytes. And then we can try to call it using uh, the B prefix on Rust strings, which basically tells, like, okay, I want this string to be. Uh, raw string, like just byte string, yeah? And we just pass it to this. Well, the problem is it doesn't work <laughs> because uh, you need to convert this to actual pointer. Now you have just array. And uh, we need to just add .sptr. This is the recommended Rust way to get pointers out of any reference to array and so on. The only small problem is this. <laughs> exactly, it doesn't work. The reason it doesn't work, as I said, like there is Python script that actually goes through LLVM bit code and searches for exactly mscript and asm const int and a pointer to some string in static memory that you can extract to JavaScript on the compilation time. When we have .sptr, at least in debug mode, Rust doesn't inline the function. So you have actual function call of sptr inside of mscript and asm const int which makes mscript and like, OK, probably this is not re real JavaScript. I want to execute it, and just nothing happens. It doesn't even warn you about it. So we will need to slightly go away from what documentation suggests and just use raw conversion instead. Luckily, at least this works. <laughs> so you can just do s star const u8, and this is normal cast. It just converts to literal like LLVM cast. mscript and can understand it. Even in debug mode, it works. The only problem, 
<laughs> uh, you, uh, it will try to read too much memory <laughs> because obviously in C string, like we need to add zero byte manually. Finally, when you add all of this, it starts working, but it looks extremely ugly. So as with everything in Rust, let's just hide it inside of macro. Then things look so much safer. So we can just implement this macro where we uh, actually get the first expression, which is like just normal JavaScript block. We stringify it, we concatenate with uh, zero byte in the end, and do this to conversions to actually get to the point where we have this uh, U8 pointers that Emscript wants from us. Finally, after that, we can do nice things like just JS alert. And like we you can put anything that we want inside of this uh, JS. And yay, it works. <laughs> <sighs> but what about like more interesting types than just integers and void? What if we want to expose some uh, Rust structures to JavaScript side to construct them, like to get their properties and so on? E Mscript itself has a solution called mbint, which is like tons of C++ magic uh, with templates uh, that convert your classes to statically to some special Mscript and calls that register them on the other side. And we will have actually to go through them to replicate the same on Rust side. So a uh, normal uh, mscripting uh, example for mbint looks like this. You just have some class. You have getter setters for your properties. Uh, and then to register it for JavaScript to see, you add this thing called mscripting bindings, where you have these templates like .class, .constructor, .property, and this has the same like for functions, class functions, and so on. And then you invoke uh, mscripting with dash dash bind, which uh, links it with special internal library that actually transforms these calls to actual JavaScript that will register your types. And then on the other side, like you, you can uh, just require this module and create uh, classes using new my class. It directly translates to C++ constructor, and you can get properties out of it, and so on. So these objects that you are constructing, uh, they actually allocate something in memory, and you can, if you go into Intel dollar dollar property, you can see the pointer in memory where it happens. You can actually access that memory directly. And by the way, like mscripting doesn't actually care about what exactly you are accessing. You can access absolutely any address. You will never get sec fault. So be extremely careful with what you are doing because you can ex like overwrite zero address. I did that. It was scary. <laughs> uh, now we just want to do the same, but get rid of all the C++ magic that so you obviously can't just use from Rust code. So let's look how exactly these templates are implemented. So let's start with registration of class itself. <laughs> That's slightly more helpful. <laughs> this is definitely more readable than this. Um, so the only thing we can do about it is reverse engineering. Yay! Who doesn't like it? Okay, let's look how exactly mbind register class that is being called here is implemented. Maybe that will help. Well, it says implementing JavaScript. Don't call this directly. Yay, obviously what we need to do, call this directly. Uh, so let's look at the full definition of this function. So it has tons of stuff. But basically, we can go just one by one. So first of all, we have type IDs for the class itself, its pointer, its const pointer, and base class. Well, we don't have base classes in Rust, as it doesn't matter, but we want still other types. So type IDs in C++, they're just like pointers to actual types. And in Rust, to get type ID, we will need to use uh, intrinsics. Intrinsics. Uh, and among this intrinsic, like Rust has special type ID where you can just pass any type and it will return you a 64-bit value that is unique only for this type across your entire code base. Uh, the only problem, this doesn't work with mscripting because mscripting expects C++ types which are 32 bits, so we need to just cast. This one was simple. Okay, so this gets rid of at least four out of all the parameters. This is extremely self-describing API, I know. 
And now we need to figure out like what uh, is the get actual type. Well, get actual type apparently is used for all this subclassing in C++, but like normally for Rust structs, you just want to return type ID of the same type that you got. So you just build a generic function that returns type ID of the type itself. I don't know why mscripten needs it, but well, if it does. Okay. Uh, now we have these uh, signatures before each function. So what exactly is signature? Uh, we need to figure that out, we need to just try to compile some function and see like what signature generates C++ code. So for example, for this function, C++ uh, uh, will, like C++ with mscripten, will just contain, well, it's not Wi-Fi, but it's Wi-Fi. <laughs> Uh, so what it actually stands for is like first letter is return type, which is just V for void, and others are arguments. So I for integers, F for floats, I for pointers. Um, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, mscripten just has three types: void, integer, and floats, and basically everything else can be represented using th these three types. Uh, and it doesn't care on the other side because when you call just from JavaScript get pointer, you still need to dereference it through one of the arrays that I earlier showed, like heap32, heap8, and so on. Okay, this seems to be pretty straightforward. We crossed out a few more of the arguments. And now we just need to uh, pass class name and uh, the actual functions. So for class name, we could use a macro but since we are using intrinsics anyway, why not to use another hidden feature of Rust? Rust allows you to get type name of any type by just calling this intrinsics and passing, uh, like it's, it's generic over any type. You, you can just pass structure, it will return you actual Rust string with name of this type. Well, the only problem, you know. <laughs> uh, so yeah, mscript always expects c-strings, so we need to actually create c-string, this will cause an as allocation, unwrap, and get pointer, and then it should work. So now we have only destructor. So uh, if we are passing ownership of Rust objects to JavaScript and expect it to be able to work with them like for a while and then return them back, destructor, uh, so most likely we will be just passing boxes Right, just creating boxes on the Rust side and passing pointers uh, to JavaScript and expect it to uh, like deallocate when needed. And uh, then destructor implementation is just basically box from row when we pass the pointer back. And what this does is basically it creates box out of the pointer that we gave it, which is hopefully allocated by the same box. And then Rust just inserts uh, implicit drop in the end of this function. So it just deallocates whatever we passed it. Yay. <laughs> now, the code when you, we try to write this all by hand looks quite ugly. <laughs> I wouldn't want to do that like for every single function, so we can at least like abstract away the uh, C strings to some nice macro. It all looks better. And then this can be wrapped into some uh, generic function where you just pass uh, your structure and it will call this on its own. Okay, another function, I promise I won't be going through all the details again. Uh, but basically we have mbin register class constructor. So let's say we are not interested in like every uh, new implementation on our structure, but only in default trade. So, uh, this one is quite much simpler, like we have already class types that we registered before. We have arguments, uh, like the account and type IDs. We have invoker, which, is, uh, which has C call-in convention, and then constructor, which can be anything. I'm part of the mscript and decided to split them just in case if by constructor you want to pass some ID or float or whatever. So on the Rust side, we just link this normal extern. Uh, and uh, for constructor, we just say that we have functions that retains box void. We will just have any box. Except Rust doesn't really like it. It will tell us that we are passing uh, improper C types because we are passing normal function and not extern one to constructor. So we will just tell it to shut up. <laughs> because it works nicely, we know we, what we are doing, or at least we are pretending to. 
Uh, and then the actual invoker, what it will be doing, it will be just doing box intero. So but this will be constructing the box on uh, Rust side and just passing pointer to JavaScript and forgetting about it so that it wouldn't drop it until JavaScript says so. And then for our uh, type, we can just get uh, type ID for pointers and pass like everything, lots of scary like pointer lens. And finally, what we are doing, we just get a default implementation of box T and we transmute it. Transmuting functions. <laughs> At least this works. <laughs> if you find a better way, please tell me. So in the end, when we wrap this all into a nice API, we can just do like take any of our structures that implements uh, default and drop and just do a register class and a register class default uh, constructor if you have default implementation. And then embedded register has lots of other things like uh, voice, booleans, integers, floats. Like we can register all these types. And when we register these type IDs, then MScripting will know how to marshal types from JavaScript side to C++ and back. Um, but for us, we are missing one of important things, which uh, since which is strings. So. While for C++, it already happily accepts C, like unsafe C strings with zero byte. It accepts std string, stdw string, but memory layout of std string is completely different from what Rust provides. And the only thing we can do is actually like either clone Rust string and add zero byte and pass uh, to mscripten, or like clone again, but in other memory layout. We don't really want to do that. We want to extend mbint to understand Rust types natively. And here we come to the next stage. Uh, how do we implement JavaScript static libraries in JavaScript? So if we want to, we just extend it and add our own APIs. So MScript provides a mechanism for that, where you just write JavaScript into, in like special kind of special syntax, uh, where you say that library manager dot library should be extended with following functions. And you can literally put, put like any JavaScript inside of it that you want. And these names, MScript and will just parse magic again and uh, expose to Rust as normal C FFI bindings. So when we just do some MyJS, which says alert high, on the Rust side, we can say dash dash JS library this JavaScript and just ex extend this function. And we can use it as any other normal C FFI function. So for us, string, uh, we can just add our own converter, which will register these types. It doesn't look extremely nice, but it's much more efficient than cloning strings on Rust side. So what we are doing here, like when we are getting pointer to str from Rust side, it's actually a fat pointer because str is slice. So it contains both length and the actual pointer to data. So we are just reading both from the heap and then calling pointer string, stringify, which actually just takes this chunk that uh, we ask it for and converts to normal JavaScript string. This way, any Rust str reference is immediately converted to JavaScript side, and it just works in any functions like console log or anything that expects strings on its side. So then, then we just call it like ambient register Rust string with type ID of and str. It registered it. Uh, now, what? Uh, if we want to get some values from JavaScript side. Here is one big issue that doesn't allow us to do that. JavaScript has garbage collection uh, where, uh, so, so ba basically like any objects will be garbage collected before they even get to Rust because ASM.js doesn't have access to the same memory that JavaScript does, just like WebAssembly. Uh, because of that, we will uh, mscript and what it does, it actually keeps separate array where it just uh, keeps any objects that we ask it to keep. This way, like while it's preserved in the same array, uh, like JavaScript engine will know not to free it. So just for example, like first we start with window, we ask for it, it generated some index for us, just five, for example. This integer we can safely pass uh, to Rust side. Then we can call another operation on this handle that we got. So say we wanted to clone this. This works just like uh, normal uh, RC reference counting type. So window had like one reference. It internally, mscript internally increases like reference count to two and so on. We can take values uh, 
out of it. So, for, for example, we want to create value from Rust string, which we just registered. We just uh, call mval take value, which is internal implementation of our API, and it registered like this string on JavaScript side again. And like we are going forth and back every time to just get these handles for every JavaScript value. Then we can do, for example, mval get property, where we just ask it get property out of five with name six. It, it gets us the actual document, and then it can safely drop window and document uh, out of this array. They will be garbage collected uh, as normal. And so what if we have simple queries where we don't actually want to expose our boxes to JavaScript, we just want to serialize them as is? Then we can use Serda. So Serda is extremely nice library. Who used it? Sorry. Yay. So Serda is extremely nice extensible library that allows you to deserialize XML JSONs and serialize them back. You, can, you just need to provide own uh, implementation of serializer. So why don't we just take all this get property, set property, and so on, and wrap them into Serda serializer? Then everything, like all, all that we need to do on the Rust side is just say derive serialize for any of our structures that we want to send to JavaScript, and just create any values serialize with asm.js serializer. It will uh, call get property, set property on each of them automatically for us, and on the other side we just have normal uh, object. Uh, how fast does this work? So if you compare just like native JSON parse with start the JSON inside of asm.js or WebAssembly, start the JSON will be about four times slower. The reason for this is like that we are not really competing with JavaScript here, but we are competing with uh, native C++ implementation inside of V8 of JSON parse. So obviously like any CCP implement by hand will be slower by default. So if you want to use Rust to just re-implement something that is already available in JavaScript, please don't, just use it directly. On the other hand, like if you want to just send values for and back, uh, if you try to, u to use Serda instead to serialize it to JSON and then parse it back uh, in JavaScript with uh, JSON parse, it will be still two times slower than just using this uh, custom serializer where we just send values directly and set all the properties and so on. Um, five minutes? Yeah. Can I show a small demo? Cool. No. Okay. I never understand how Mac Windows work. Why doesn't it appear on the other side? Where is it? <laughs> oh. Okay. <sighs> I just don't want to do mirroring. Okay, so mm, let me go to. Huh. Where is my term? Okay, let's go to, so this code is uh, available on GitHub, I'll share the link later, like that already wraps this whole inter safe interface. So let's just try to add some, um, some simple stuff. Okay, sorry, wait one second. <laughs> All right. Hey, print and hello world. So let's try to just uh, add our crate which is asm.js, and this asm.js is available just one folder ahead. So we will just ask for now to just take it from the same path. 
And let's say we do awesome.js serializer and awesome.js you know, value just to see how this works. So uh, through the safe interface, we can uh, access all the global's properties and so on. So first of all, let's just try to get global. And let's see if that compiles. Let's add some index HTML. And build this just with target us JS. Can we have more time for Rust compiler to kick in? <laughs> no. Ah, yeah. <laughs> the only problem. So what we need to do now is actually add link arcs, as this is currently the only way. And we need to ask first dash dash bind for MCC to actually link the library and add our JavaScript library. So there is a pull request to Rust, which had to improve this. Is Alex Crichton here? Hello. So I tried to get it in time for this conference <laughs> into Rust itself <laughs> to improve this. <laughs> we will talk afterwards. <laughs> But yeah, for, for now, you actually have to use link arcs for this and pass this all manually. Hopefully, this will work anyway. And we can do uh, things like, say we want, I don't know, get um, navigator, get user agent. So all the strings will be converted uh, through mscript and APIs. And now, say that we want to get string out of this. Yeah? because Rust doesn't know how to print just gen generic JavaScript handles. So it's all implemented through normal into from traits. So it just works through string from at like any JavaScript value. And please, please, please. <laughs> Yay, it builds. And now in target. Uh, <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> so we just add this script. Uh, so we can extract it out, but it's easier to this way. We can just add the script and try to open this HTML in browser. Let's see what we have in the console. Where is console? Yeah, this autocomplete plugin is awesome, but it doesn't add extensions. <sighs> Yay, we got user agent, like directly to Rust and printed it back. <laughs> so, and actually this val implements like all other normal Rust traits, like we can do iterators that are normal ES6, like JavaScript iterators, but converted to Rust ones without extra arrays and so on. So for example, if you want to just, uh, enumerate all the plugins that our browser has. We can just do for plugin in global get navigator get plugins, like just native plugins, and we can like print each of them. But I don't know what I need to print. Let's see how it looks in JavaScript. Yeah, yeah that's the last one, seriously. So just dot name, okay. Plugin get name. And yeah, we printed the plugins that our browser has. So and like everything is mapped to normal Rust uh, types. It just works. Oh yeah. Useful links. So this uh, code that does all the safe binnies for all these hacks that I showed, well, safe, as in like suppressed warnings, um, is available on GitHub by this address. Like you can read about mscript and APIs that are already available like for networking and everything. Uh, the other link and the other two are pull requests that should improve 
uh, how you use Rust with JavaScript, uh, well, feel free to help, like join in and so on, or just like, and so on. Yeah, questions? Okay.